Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction Company taking a look at a really interesting piece of really unknown history. This is a Remington rolling block rifle off of the USS Niagara. And we know exactly where it came from because it's got Niagara written in it in big old block letters here. Now, the story of the Niagara, I think, is a really fascinating one. It's one of these stories that illustrates how people don't change all that much over time. And things that we may think about being, you know, outrageous today, well, they're not new. So uh, the setting here is the Spanish-American War, or rather the lead-up to the Spanish-American War. This was, of course, all based on unrest in Cuba. And uh, there were a lot of powerful American business interests who supported uh, the, the insurgents in Cuba, the revolutionaries in Cuba, in the 1890s. And of course the Spanish government owned Cuba, and Spain was not very happy that the U.S. was, well they claimed the U.S. was complicit in allowing arms trafficking into the, the insurgents, and uh, they probably were. Um, and in particular there were some U.S. publications that really kept just beating the drum for war with Spain. Get, you know, help the Cubans, kick the Spanish out of Cuba for years on end. Uh, in particular William Randolph Hearst supported this and, and promoted it. Um, and eventually war finally did happen. When the Maine exploded under mysterious circumstances, a couple hundred American sailors killed, that was the spark that was able to push America into war with Spain. So uh, on, against this backdrop there is a lot of popular opinion for war in Spain. And when war becomes a reality, there is what appears to have probably been like an orchestrated propaganda sort of move, um, set up to look like a popular out, you know, bursting out of support for the war effort. And this was a group of, uh, of private individuals in New York State who financed a U.S. Navy ship to go help fight the Spanish in Cuba. It was the USS Niagara. This was a ship that was actually constructed in 1877. And this group of citizens, although it's really, it appears to have actually been a very small group of very wealthy millionaires um, who actually did this under the guise of, oh, this is grassroots. Uh, they uh, acquired the ship and they basically outfitted it and donated it to the Navy for the war effort. And it was the USS Niagara, and it was outfitted actually as a water distiller and supply ship. Um, of course, not something you'd normally think about, but you know, if you're supporting a land invasion of an island, you need to have water, and salt water is not drinkable. So they set up a ship to distill salt water into fresh water to supply the uh, the expedition. Well. Uh, this ship has a crew of 57, including 12 marines, so they need some arms on board. And this whole ship was outfitted by, basically, William Randolph Hearst and some buddies. And they outfit it like a luxury yacht, despite the fact that it is legitimately and literally a Navy ship now, once they give it to the Navy. So not just the officers, but even, even the, the sailors had uh, porcelain porcelain china for their, their messes, and silver, uh, actual silver flatware. And all of the arms, for example, that, that were used, that were purchased to equip the marine contingent on the ship, they're all embossed, every bit of it, the, the mills belts, the, the rifles, the revolvers, it's all embossed with Niagara. Um, like, it, it's really pretty odd. Uh, and this ship has a, a grand total service life of six months. So uh, in it, it spends basically June and July on station in Cuba. There is no record of it actually doing anything or participating in any sort of action, although presumably it did distill some water. Uh, so uh, at the end of July 1898 it uh, leaves station, it sails up to New York, it arrives there in September, where it's promptly decommissioned and then sold for scrap. It, it appears that basically um, this was a, a propaganda, public, uh, public outreach sort of thing by Hearst and his buddies, and its job was pretty much done the moment the ship departed. Like, it didn't matter what the ship actually did, what mattered was that they set this thing up and, and whatever. And the Navy apparently wasn't particularly interested in having this one oddball weird ship privately commissioned, like, it wasn't helpful, it didn't really fit in, and they just kind of wanted to get rid of it, which is exactly what they did. When it was sold for scrap, 
none other than Francis Bannerman was there. Uh, of, of course, Bannerman, one of the, the major uh, military surplus dealers of this period, uh, 19th century into the early 20th century, and he appears to have bought up almost all of the stuff off the ship. And he would list Niagara accoutrements in his catalogue until 1927, and that includes rifles. So let me show you what this rifle actually looks like, and what it, well, what it is for that matter. So what you have here is an 1896 pattern of Remington rolling block. This is top of the line uh, for that period. This was the, the newest modernized version of the rolling block, really good quality steel. This was uh, intended for use with smokeless powder, that relatively new uh, invention. And this particular one is chambered for 7mm Mauser, um, which was an, it's an excellent cartridge. Uh, I suppose they decided that since the Marine boarding party wasn't really going to be interacting with a land invasion force, presumably they didn't have to have ammunition interchangeability. Um, and there were some the New York National Guard, I believe, used 7mm Mauser rolling blocks as well. So yeah, it kind of made sense in that context. The barrel is marked 7mm SM, or 7mm MSM up here. That stands for Spanish Mauser, because that was the predominant user of the cartridge at the time, or at least the one that uh, Remington was selling to. Uh, these rifles did also sell pretty extensively through South America, uh, but the US military really never adopted the, the rolling block in a, in a real large way. The rear sight there, good out to 1400 yards. Of course the most interesting part of this is the Niagara uh, name, roll well engraved across the top of the receiver there. Uh, this was done custom by Remington for this order for 35 rifles uh, for the boarding party. 12 marines, but they ordered 35 rifles uh, for the ship. And uh, this had to be done during the manufacturing process because it's a case hardened receiver, which means it's really quite hard. and not feasible to do this engraving through the case hardening. So that was engraved, and then the receivers were case hardened and finished. Gorgeously polished and, and finished rifles. Uh, it's really a beautiful example of what a rolling block can be. Nice crisp front sight, cleaning rod, bayonet lug out here. There's the notch to hold the bayonet in place. Um, there were bayonets also uh, outfitted for these rifles on the ship, although this one doesn't have a bayonet with it. And there you go, that is a beautiful example of a now, boy, what, 120 year old Remington rolling block made for really the weirdest of purposes. So if that's not one of the more odd and strange stories behind a Remington rolling block that you've ever heard, I don't know what would be. Uh, it's a magnificent rifle, as you would expect. Hearst paid top dollar for, you know, for a for, you know, state-of-the-art modern rolling block great looking case hardening, this nice Niagara logo on it. Uh, all for nothing, ultimately, um, for no particular accomplishment, but we're left with some really pretty interesting artifacts from, a, I think, really a pretty unknown uh, little side anecdote of history. So there are, I think, four or five of these that are known to still exist in nice condition, and so they're really quite scarce guns. Um, if you'd like to have this particular one, especially perhaps you have some personal connection to New York or Niagara or William Randolph Hearst perhaps, I don't know. Um, if you're interested in it, it is being sold here at Morphe's in their upcoming fall firearms auction. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to ForgottenWeapons.com from whence you can get to Morphe's catalogue page on this rifle, and you can also poke around their catalogue for all the other interesting stuff that they're selling in the auction. And um, well, Thanks for watching, and stay tuned tomorrow for another interesting Forgotten Weapon.